webinar, the Biposa is, Biposa is the British Isles Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Association. We have a distinguished faculty of speakers who are going to address surgical techniques in strabismus. I would now like to introduce Dr. Ian Dafaba, who's the president of IPOS to give the opening speech. Thank you. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening uh, to uh, all colleagues. Uh, I would like to introduce the moderators of uh, the IPOS BIPOSA uh, symposium uh, or webinar on surgical techniques in strabismus. I'm Jan de Faber. I took over uh, the presidency of uh, Farouk Orge uh, uh, July 1st, so it's uh, first for me. Uh, I would like to introduce the moderators uh, of uh, this webinar. Uh, first of all, this will be <clears throat> Andrea Molinari. She's, she's a program director of Pediatric Ophthalmology Fellowship uh, Program Hospital Metropolitano in Quito, Ecuador. And she is also the vice president of ISA. And from the uh, Biposa, we have Saurabh Jain. Um, he is a consultant of uh, ophthalmic surgeon and clinical director of the Royal Free Hospital in London. He's an honorary associate professor at UCL. He's the education officer of Biposa, and his affiliations are uh, APOS, ESA, ESA, and he is a member of the Royal College of Ophthalmology. Thank you very much. Have uh, lots of fun and uh, see you hopefully uh, somewhere in the future. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Dr. Dafaba. I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Taylor, who is the president of Viposa, and request him to give a few words. Dr. Bob. Thank you very much um, and welcome everybody around the world. Uh, I'm speaking to you from a very sunny Yorkshire in the UK. So I'm uh, president of the um, British and Irish uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Association. Uh, we um, primarily run a meeting once a year. And this was all disrupted as you can imagine through the uh, COVID pandemic but we are running a face-to-face -face meeting in Bristol um, on the 28th of September. If anybody wishes to sign up to that, um, the uh, meeting is now open for applicants. Um, it's run over three days with primarily pediatric ophthalmology in the first day, a mixture of that and strabismus in the second day and primarily strabismus in the third day. Um, the association has uh, international members although not many and uh, we would welcome any further any expressions of interest we also have a research award that is up to five thousand pounds that's english pounds um, primarily as a pump priming research um, award uh, so we are looking for early researchers not perhaps somebody who's already got tons of research under their belt and massive budgets to work with. We're looking to try and support an early researcher. And we also have an award for a travel fellowship. Again, I aimed at young ophthalmologists uh, or orthoptists who are traveling to a different country and need financial support. Um, our membership is primarily ophthalmologists and orthoptists with a few uh, pediatric optometrists uh, thrown in. Um, but we try and keep the board and the presentations uh, interesting to all areas of pediatric ophthalmology, um, including um, those that might be presented by orthoptists, and we try and support them. Um, so that's the British and Irish Pediatric Ophthalmology Association introduction. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand you back to the moderators. Hello from Ecuador. Uh, it is my great pleasure to co-moderate today's webinar together with Dr. Surab Jain from the UK 
And without further delay, we will hear, hear, hear our first presentations by Dr. Robert Taylor, who is going to talk on fornix incision for strabismus surgery. Well, I'm going to talk about uh, fornix incisions and mention minimally invasive strabismus surgery in this talk. Thank you for inviting me. So the minimum, uh, fornix incisions were invented to uh, relieve the need to do a limbal incision. The incision is um, on the bulbar conjunctiva, approximately nine millimeters back from the limbus. You need to identify where the horizontal rectus is. Here you can see the medial um, an incision is made through the conjunctiva and then through the tenons capsule. Here we've got a similar uh, alignment for a lateral rectus. You can see the lateral rectus here, slightly darker. On this particular example, the um, tenons doesn't lift off quite as nicely. So you have to be sure to make a pocket underneath the tenons capsule so that you can slide your squint to the ground um, and identify the rectus muscle. So I'm using a Jameson squint hook. There are many alternatives uh, similar. These are important so that you rotate um, the squint hook so that the heel is buried under the um, muscle before you rotate it. As you pass the um, squint hook through, try not to rotate the end before the heel is buried so that the rotation of the squint hook is around the heel. Uh, so the fulcrum is the heel of the squint hook. Here I've got another example on a medial where I don't get all the muscle in one go and you can see the heel disappears posteriorly because the end of the squint hook is stuck. So as you rotate the handle, the heel goes more posteriorly. So in this example, you can see the fulcrum of rotation is at the end, so the heel goes posteriorly, and this tells you you haven't gone through the whole muscle. So here you see it again, it gets stuck. Um, at this point, I've already removed the locking forcep, so you have to pass another squint hook underneath it in order to uh, maintain control of the eye and make sure you get the whole muscle. So this time I can see the end of it come through and now the heel is the fulcrum of rotation. So once you've got the whole muscle, you can then lift the conjunctiva over the end and then you need to button hold the intermuscular membrane or tenons capsule behind the, uh, or superior to the horizontal rectus. Now at this point it's possible that you've button hold through the the rectus. Um, it's more likely on a medial, uh, sorry, on a lateral rectus, but possible on either. At this point, you need to uh, do what's known as a C maneuver. You pass the squint hook from behind the insertion, round the side, and in front. If there was a strand of muscle, you would not be able to pass that smoothly. Here it is done again. So once you've got sure you've got the whole muscle, you can lift the conjunctiva off with squint hooks uh, and dissect off um, how, however much you want to, to do, depending a little bit on whether it's a recession or a section, um, just as you would with any other incision. It's particularly important perhaps to dissect off the tenons in, in front of the muscle if you're doing a resection or hand back procedure. On this side, I've got the incision as you saw before. I'm just going to let this run. Uh, you can see the, in, the insertion of the squint hook. I'm happy with the rotation. Lift over the conjunctiva just as you did on the lateral. Buttonhole the tenons capsule superior. I've edited out the C maneuver. Cut down either side to um, free up the muscle and again careful dissection anterior to the muscle of the tenons so that when you place your sutures 
the tenons doesn't snare the knot and make it difficult to tie down. I then do a bit of cautery just because you're about to cut the muscle off. In this point, it's a resection. I've edited out placing the sutures. And here it's important that we're about to cut the muscle off. So when you do that, you lose control of the eye unless you place a locking forcep superiorly. So I usually do a bit of cautery uh, just in case it bleeds when you take it off. And then you can now safely uh, dissect off the muscle. Once you've done that, you would have lost control if you hadn't got the locking forcep on. And it also serves to hold the conjunctiva out of the way while you clean up your muscle. It's important to keep the suture out of the scissors. Uh, and one way of doing that is holding the suture in the same hand as you're holding the squint hook. So here I've got a lateral being dissecting it, dissected off. And again, you can see I've placed a locking forcep superior on the insertion before dissecting it away, uh, either after making a little nick so that it holds the conjunctiva out of the way. On this medial rectus, um, as I pull the squint hook forward, you can see a little bit of tenons capsules being dragged through. And it seems a good idea just to dissect that off, keeping your sutures well out of the way. At this point, just as in any other procedure, you uh, insert your scleral bites. I would always try and on a recession, do a direct attachment. But if there's not enough room, do a modified hand back so that the muscle is closely approximated to the sclera. Clearly, if you're doing a recession, you would just do a hanging back procedure. I would like to illustrate that I just check the muscles where it should be before um, closing uh, or stopping the procedure, because it could be, of course, hanging back. Um, so you just lift up the conjunctiva and check your assessed muscle is close to where your marks were. At this point, just like any other procedure, you complete your knot, trim the sutures, and you're going to remove the locking forcep. Just check for any bleeding because it tends to bleed out the hole. Otherwise, you take the suture off, just stroke the conjunctiva down, and, and that's all I do. I don't close the conjunctiva with any other method. Here's a child uh, a week following a recess resect. You can see the inflamed area in the right eye, medial and lateral. Another child um, a week or so following a bilateral medial rectus procedure. Now, minimally invasive surgery designed by Daniel Mojon of um, Switzerland uh, attempts to reduce the conjunctival incisions even further. Uh, you can access the muscle um, by lifting the conjunctiva stroke tenons either way. Um, you must be careful you've got the whole muscle in a similar way to a fornix incision and you can recess them using separate sutures on the upper and lower pole. Resections aren't really possible but you can do application. Uh, he would recommend passing the muscle suture through the conjunctiva to make sure you've got the whole muscle and then uh, removing it much as a mechanical suture and then making application over an instrument such. So minimally invasive surgery is an option in adults where fornix incisions tend to tear, uh, there's less exposure of the muscle, um, and a recession is feasible, but not really an adjustable or a resection. Fornix incisions are very good for younger patients, children and young adults. You need care to define the muscle attachment, uh, and do be careful to maintain control of the eye with locking forceps in the manner shown when you dissect off the muscle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, for your excellent video and welcome all of you. It's uh, such a pleasure to see so many of you with us today. We've got over 40 participants at the moment. Just to say, if you have any questions for Bob Taylor or need any of our other speakers, please place them in the Q&A box or the chat box, so the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Our panel will try and answer the questions as we go along. But if they haven't, then we'll have a little discussion at the end if time allows. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our second speaker, Professor Vincent Paris from uh, Belgium, who's going, to, uh, who's going to give us a talk about surgery for excyclotorsion. torsion. Over to you, Vincent.
Except for fresh cases, let's speak here about excyclotorsion and not about forced nerve palsy. Because superior oblique is mainly a tendon, transforming with time after, or after surgery and having a significant delay of decompensation in many cases with individual adaptation mechanism. So let's speak also about unilateral cases, the most complicated because we see here variable vertical component. We're passing to many clinical aspects. Here, a normal cover test with a huge excyclo. Here, individual adaptation with a, uh, intermittent hypo and a huge excyclo on the right. Here, variable hyper with cyclofusion. We use an original method of subjective measurement of excyclo designed by our PICE. Analyzing topographically uh, the different uh, deviation using a uh, linear pointer and uh, analyzing also the fusion uh, because there are two phases of the test and uh, possible possibility to fuse the back dots on the opposite phase, phase of the test. We analyze also the tilted position. And this test is much more appropriate compared to Lancaster, and also compared to Maddox, with a much higher sensitivity, giving much more data. The main point in excyclo management is the vertical aspect due to superior rectus contraction. Disregarding the etiology, the superior, retraction, superior rectus contraction occurs and may transform into contracture. Let's take an example, DVD as a demonstrative model, especially when DVD is much higher on the dominant eye in a patient with a very strong dominance, you can have observe an in cyclo uh, deviation in this dominant eye. Let's see here on the left with the DVD on the left an in cyclo, very important. Here on the right, very significant in cyclo. Why so uh, 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 demonstrative? demonstrative? Because DVD has no basic extortion. So we see here very clearly the effect, the in cyclo effect of the superior rectus contractor, which is the main trap of evaluation. So superior rectus recession seems to be necessary, but it works only if excyclo remains still provoking superior rectus stimulus and apparent good result with in cyclo effect but after years we see less recurrence of cyclodipopia so when we have sign of superior rectus contracture we have to exclude of course associated dvd but there is an older estimation of the real excyclo present so here is a mixed case with DVD and excyclo on the right. And we have a basic excyclo here. The surgery is based for DVD and we used inferior oblique anterior nasal transposition for residual excyclo on the same eye with a very good result. Here is only a case report. But the superior rectus comportment is very, it's a main key of understanding excyclo. Hyper is a trap. We, we uh, describe the superior rectus recess. Uh, if uh, the uh, excyclo is resolved, you have a rapid consecutive hypo. Uh, if you propose to uh, re perform an inferior oblique anterior transposition, you have uh, a less efficacy of, uh, to reduce the X cyclo. So, if your oblique overaction persists, induce IPO. Superior rectus contraction is present at any age. But here is the case uh, when you, after performing combined pure oblique surgery, the restriction on dung disappeared. So we propose to consider a superior rectus contracture 
as a sign to propose this sign as a four-step test. Sometimes the four-step test present in 76% of work cases is the only one to be observed on a cover test. Let's go back to DVD as a demonstrative model. When DVD is much higher on the dominant eye with a strong dominance, you, can, you, you observe in hypo the dominant, dominated eye. Uh, Eunice published uh, some years ago that asymmetric DVD could masquerade a double elevator palsy. And uh, many of us have remembered the case proposed by John Lee when he uh, supposed to have a double elevator palsy uh, and uh, after performing vertical nap procedure, he induced a huge excitement. We see also a case from Peter Fels with the same misdiagnosis. So we think that in these cases, the, uh, the patient required maximal oblique surgery. It is a case of Peter Fels. I had to operate a complaint for, for, of diplopia from for 30 years. After huge surgery on superior oblique, he was very satisfied. This is another presentation with double elevator palsy pseudo and a significant X cyclo and a perfect result after inferior oblique and nasal transposition. Uh, we can see that type of cases. Uh, the main trap of X cyclo management is not only uh, for uh, to, to observe superior to contracture, but also inferior oblique contracture which can mask the elevation in that duction. In that type of cases, we uh, perform inferior oblique recession with very good results. So many people said, uh, no need to change my practice, my results are very good. But what about the reality? Uh, many under correction, many over correction. And in our experience, we perform single inferior oblique recess only in, in moderate X cycle. A better huge superior big reinforcement procedure is very safe and efficient. We never perform inferior rectus recess and superior rectus recess only when we have DVD or in elderly people with long term evolution. To get the good results with 10 years of evolution with pure unilateral X cycle, we have to perform mainly oblique surgery. And we had three cases of induced brown, two were acquired cases with only simple Aroda Ito procedure, only one persisting overcorrection. Here um, we propose our, our uh, technique uh, to reinforce the superior oblique muscle. It's a mix between Aroda Ito and resection. Maximal traction of superior oblique at the level of superior rectus tendon, suture of the tendon reaching the superior rectus insertion, resection of the part of the tendon, and adduction test. And we see here uh, what we do is very simple and uh, it takes a couple of minutes. Now, brown induced sometime uh, after a very important uh, amount of surgery. We propose a documented surgery in inferior big nasal transposition. Stagger technique uh, published, uh, for, uh, was published originally for congenital absence of superior oblique. To get more in cyclo effect, we propose to pass some time uh, according to the inferior oblique elasticity, the inferior oblique under the inferior rectus, even with resection and sometime up to the medial rectus with extending indication. Our approach in oblique surgery is based on extensive use of topical anesthesia, allowing non-programmed but necessary sometimes combined surgery. And we can realize easily inferior oblique nasal transposition. Advanced resect technique is self-adjustable, simple and efficient. And we prefer systematically uh, inferior to recess and single procedure. So we propose uh, to uh, perform oblique muscle 
and uh, it is very difficult to uh, explain all the aspect during a session of 10 minutes, but I try to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Very interesting to hear your approach to these cases. And next, we're going to hear uh, to our co-moderator, Dr. Sarab Jahi from the UK, who's going to talk on inferior oblique weakening procedures, myectomy versus anteri anteriorization of the inferior oblique. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are today. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this webinar. I'm so excited to be part of this collaboration between IPOSC and BIPOSA, and I would like to thank AAO for hosting us. My name is Saurabh Jain. I'm a consultant ophthalmologist at the Royal Pre Hospital London. I'm going to talk about inferior oblique weakening, myectomy versus anterization. We will start with this case, a 30-year-old man who came to see me in clinic complaining of vertical double vision for as long as he could remember, but felt it was now getting worse over the past few months. He was finding it difficult to read for long periods. He was aware of it had posture and associated social anxiety. No previous ocular trauma, surgery, or any significant medical history, and normal vision. On examination of his ocular motility, you can see he has quite good alignment in primary gaze. But as soon as he looks to the right hand side, the left eye shoots up. So he has this over elevation in adduction, which is very characteristic of a secondary inferior oblique overaction due to a inherent superior oblique palsy on the left side. This is the measurement of his ocular deviation in nine positions of gaze. And whenever you have a incompetent squint, it's always helpful, I find, to separate out the vertical from the horizontal from the torsional measurements. So here you can see uh, vertically, he has a left hypertropia that is most in dextro depression, but almost the same in dextro elevation and dextroversion. It is much less in all lever positions. He has a bit of excital torsion that's most in down gaze, and he has a small esophoria in down gaze and is exophoric in primary and up gaze. This is all very typical of a left fourth nerve palsy and he needs treatment for which we would try and tackle the muscles that work where the deviation is the most, which would be in dextroversion. And here, my operation of choice would be a inferior oblique weakening procedure on the left side. Come across inferior oblique overaction in two different sets of patients. Firstly, those with primary inferior oblique overaction, these are people who are born with this over elevation of their eyes in adduction. It can be seen in isotropia. So 70% of all infantile isotropes and 30% of all developmental isotropes have some element of primary inferior oblique overaction, but also in exotropia, in about 30% of cases where it gives rise to a V pattern. It tends to be bilateral and symmetrical in these cases with a small vertical deviation in primary position and this over elevation of the eye in adduction with a minimal head tilt and no Bilchowskis. Or you can have inferior oblique overaction that is secondary either to an ipsilateral fourth nerve palsy or rarely to a contralateral superior rectus palsy. This causes increased deviation in the primary position, much more so than in the primary overactors with a marked head tilt and a positive Bilchowskis test as we have seen in our case. Inferior oblique weakening is a very successful procedure and usually both the patients and the surgeon are very pleased with the outcome. Now there are many ways to weaken this muscle. You can carry out a tenotomy, a myotomy, a myectomy, a recession, extraction denovation or the transposition procedures. What you choose depends a bit on your training, also on the amount of deviation, and then, of course, by what else is coexisting with the inferior oblique overaction, such as a horizontal strabismus, the head posture, the pattern, the DVD, or nystagmus. So when there is a plethora of choices, what do we choose and why? So the methods I used during my surgical career essentially divided into these two. I started off doing myectomies because this is how I was trained. They're easy to perform, they're easy to train people on with minimal suturing. It consists of identifying the muscle, 
removing the central one inch of the belly and cauterizing the ends well and ensuring there is no residual fibers. However, the results can be a bit variable depending on whether you have left any muscle fibers behind. And if you do have to reoperate because of recurrence of the strabismus, it can be quite tricky because of variable attachment of the stump of the inferior oblique. Entrization is a little bit more difficult to learn, but once you know what you're doing, I find it as easy a technique. You identify the muscle and then it is divided in the tendinous part, so there is no risk of bleeding. And then the fibers are reattached next to the inferior rectus and they work in such a way that the neurovascular bundle serves as the functional origin and it becomes a very powerful anti-elevator leading to a significant reduction in the hyperdeviation. It's got a very powerful effect, but if the muscle is anterized further than the inferior rectus, you can cause an anti-elevation syndrome and some people have described the fullness of the loaded if the muscle is bunched up when it is reattached. Transposition of the inferior oblique muscle results in the posterior temporal fibers being stretched from the ancillary origin at the neurofibrovascular bundle to the new insertion. Therefore, you need to pay meticulous attention to suture placement as misplacing the posterior fibers of this muscle anteriorly or laterally can result in an anti-elevation syndrome. There are three ways in which this muscle can be reattached. Either you attach, you bundle up the muscle and attach both the anterior and posterior fibers just next to the IR, as you see in the first diagram, or you go just anterior to the inferior rectus, or as in my technique, you just suture the anterior one-third of the fibers next to the IR, but let the posterior one-third hang loose so that the, uh, there, there's no risk of stretching of the neovascular bundle and no risk of causing an anti-elevation syndrome. Because I had changed my technique and moved from one to the other, I had two groups of patients already uh, laid out for me, the myectomy group and then the latter an anterization group. And we, we carried out a study which we published in JPOS 2021 looking at the effectiveness of infraoblique myectomy versus anterior transposition for hypertropia. And most of these patients uh, were those with superior oblique palsy. So we had 40 patients, 21 in the myectomy group and 19 in the infraoblique anthrization group. And they were well matched for both age and sex. Looking at the preoperative hypertropia, although it wasn't significant, it was slightly higher in the IO80 group compared to the myectomy group. So how did they do? Well, both in terms of the overall reduction in the hypertropia, as well as percentage reduction, infraoblique contraception performed significantly better than myectomy. And you can see here the p-value is 0 0.002. This is, was true both for near uh, and well as distance, although the effects were less uh, significant for distance measurements. More importantly, this percentage reduction of prism diopters was well maintained for up to six months of follow-ups in both the groups and the difference was successively maintained as well. Here are some of the other studies on the same topic. This first paper by Gazavi et al. looked at 81 patients and they found that in their hands myectomy and infraoblique anthrization were equally effective. Interestingly though, the groups were not really matched and they use infraoblique anthrization procedures on the more severe cases. It suggests that it was probably more efficacious. Mochnik groups only had 10 patients and they compared IO80 and recession and they found that they were in this group of patients almost equal, although IO80 was more likely to cause hypodeviation in upgaze. Min and colleagues have this paper from BJO and they have 20 patients and they again looked at IO80 versus myectomy. Now they found that IOT was significantly more successful than might by 85% to 25%, uh, whereas our group was 89 versus, 89 versus 76%. Of note, their cohort were mostly children with primary infraoblique overaction, whereas ours were second infraoblique overaction. They also found there was residual overaction in 10% of IOAT and 75% of my group, and we found only 11 and 26. And again, I wonder because of the different nature of the uh, conditions. And this last paper was one of the biggest I could find with the largest cohort by 
Huang um, et al. from uh, General Clinical Medicine, 167 patients, and they found that intraoblique antrization performed the same as myectomy. However, they treated these groups differently. So myectomy was performed by people with bilateral superior oblique palsy, where everybody who had unilateral intraoblique overaction treated by a graded IOAT. So they're probably not comparable to our study. In conclusion, inferoblique overaction may be primary, as in associated with esotropia or exotropia, or secondary to superior oblique palsy. Inferoblique weakening is a very effective surgical procedure, leaving both a happy patient and a happy surgeon. Of the various techniques available, myectomy or recession are technically easier, but there's a risk of undercorrection and difficulty with reoperation. Inferoblique antrization is a excellent alternative. It has a significant impact on the hyperdeviation because it's a very powerful procedure, but you have to take care not to stretch the neurovascular bundle or it can be associated with an anti-elevation syndrome. Many thanks for your attention. I'd be grateful for any questions. Thank you very much for the previous speaker. And um, I'd like to introduce our very own Tony Vivian from Cambridge in England to give us the next talk about superior oblique tucking for fourth palsy. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak at this webinar. I thought I would talk about superior oblique tuck for fourth nerve paresis and see if I could answer some of my own questions. When is the superior oblique tuck the right operation for fourth nerve paresis? How much height can we expect to correct with the superior oblique tuck in the primary position and how much in contralateral gaze positions? Does superior oblique tuck correct torsional deviation? If so, how much? And if superior oblique tuck is used subsequent to inferior oblique anterior transposition, will this compound the elevation restriction? This man drove his car into a tree. Um, he was unconscious, had to be airlifted to hospital, required a tracheostomy, an MRI of his head showed appearances consistent with diffuse axonal injury with pontine contusion. In the early stages following his brain injury, he had severe impairment of higher brain functions. He had constant double vision since becoming conscious. Um, we saw him about two months after he was released from hospital, and I'm going to go through his nine positions of gaze measurements bit by bit. The first thing is that he had a left hypertropia in the primary position, not measuring very much, only seven prison doctors. This increased on right gaze to 18 prison doctors of left hypertropia, but on right gaze, it reversed to six prison doctors of left hypotropia or right hypertropia, whichever way you want to look at it. Versions showed that he had bilateral superior oblique paresis or limitation, which is worse in the left eye than the right eye. Uh, tilt test showed that when he tilted his head to the right, he had a right hypertropia measuring eight prism doctors, but when he tilted it to the left, he had a left hypertropia measuring 18 prism doctors. He had significant uh, degrees of excitular torsion in each eye. In, he had a V pattern and in down gaze, he has an esotropia measuring about 16 prism doctors. So to summarize his findings, he has a left hypertropia in the primary position, which increases on right gaze. It reverses to right hypertropia on left gaze. He has alternating head tilts um, on left and right tilt. Uh, versions show that he has a bilateral superior oblique weakness, worse in the left eye, and he has greater than 20 degrees of excitator torsion. He has an esotropia in down gaze. So signs of bilateral fourth nerve palsy, which are worth looking out for, are reversal of height on left and right gaze, reversal of head tilts, significant excitler torsion, and esotropia in down gaze. So he has a bilateral traumatic fourth nerve paresis with significant torsion. And how are we going to treat him? 
Well, torsion is a barrier to fusion. So unfortunately, prisms didn't make any difference. He still had constant diplopia. So he had to wear a black patch all the time. He couldn't walk without his black patch on. So what are his surgical management options? Well, the first considerations are when to operate. So in general, I tend to leave them for six months post-trauma. Um, they often don't get to us until um, some time post-trauma. Uh, and certainly I would like to see some stable constant measurements over a number of visits. And the next consideration is what our operation will give us the largest area of BSV and improve his symptoms. So if we look at his pre-op measurements, the two major areas we're going to look at is firstly his torsion, because if we don't correct his torsion, he's not going to be able to fuse. And the next thing is his incompetence in down gaze. And if you look, when he looks down to his left, he has a right hypertrophy beer measuring eight prism doctors. And when he looks down to his right, he has 16 prism dots of left hypertrophy. So he has 24 prism dots of incompetence. And this needs to be approached by our surgical correction. So our surgical options, we could weaken both inferior obliques, but unfortunately this would not address his torsion and wouldn't address his incompetence in down gaze, as this is an operation which is much more effective in up gaze. We could perform a bilateral Harada Ito procedure. This would certainly address his torsion, but unfortunately wouldn't address his incompetence um, in down gaze or his primary, uh, primary position deviation. Or we could tuck his left superior oblique, uh, which will address his incompetence in down gaze and his primary position height, and to some degree torsion, and perform a right Harada Ito procedure to get the rest of his torsional exactotropia. So how effective is superior oblique tuck in correcting incompetence and down gaze? And how effective is it at correcting exactor torsion compared to an operation such as Harada Ito procedure? We looked at um, 56 consecutive cases of superior oblique tuck, and this is a sort of heat map showing where the tuck was most effective. And you can see it's most effective down here, this is patients that had a left superior oblique tuck, so it's down here looking down to the right. These are patients with the right superior oblique tuck, so the biggest deviation is down here to the left. So if we look at mean changes, um, the primary position change, mean change was about five prison doctors. Much greater in contralateral down gaze, 12 prison doctors of correction, and less in contralateral up gaze, only six prison doctors of correction. Um, and we then divided the groups into those that had superior oblique tuck only as an operation and those that had superior oblique tuck after having had an inferior oblique anterior transposition previously. And we can see that those patients that had a previous inferior oblique weakening procedure, the superior oblique tuck was more effective. It's, it's sort of vaguely statistically significant, but only just, but you will get more effect after in those patients that have previously had an inferior oblique procedure. Other results from the study. So uh, not all of our patients had uh, torsional deviations, but those that did, uh, a superior oblique tax get somewhere between six and 10 degrees of exciclotropia correction. Um, when I look at the last patient that had superior oblique tuck in one eye and Harada Ito in the other, the tuck reduced exactly torsion by from 10 degrees to 3 degrees, and the Harada Ito from 15 to 5 degrees, and the diplopia was controlled at this measurement. The other thing we found is that superior oblique tuck is a self titrating operation. So the correlation between the pre op deviation and the amount of correction was quite high. So the bigger the deviation, the more effect you're going to get from your from the superior oblique tuck. So it's effectively an all or none operation, which saves us having to make to, um, uh, tricky decisions. So our next concern was how much whether superior oblique tuck restriction of elevation would compound the restriction we see uh, after inferior oblique overaction. So 40% of our patients had recorded restriction of elevation in adduction. Um, these were very small deviation on a scale of zero to four. 
um, only 6% had minus two restriction of elevation. And there was no significant difference between the superior uh, oblique tuck only group and those that had had a superior oblique tuck after an inferior oblique anterior transposition. In no patient was the restriction a significant symptom and 96% of patients were satisfied after their surgery. Uh, two weeks post-operatively, um, his primary position deviation is corrected. He only had one prison doctor right hypotropia. His torsion is corrected and he came in without his black patch. He still has a small esotropia and down gaze, but this doesn't um, limit his area of binocular single vision. So in conclusion, analyzing nine positions of gaze measurements is very important, including measured tilt tests in order to pick up signs of bilaterality. Torsion is a barrier to fusion and it definitely needs to be sorted out. Signs of bilaterality might be quite subtle, but it's important to pick them up if we're going to make good decisions about uh, what surgical intervention we're going to do. Superior oblique tuck is principally an operation to manage incompetence in down gaze. It's self-titrating, so it's an all or none operation. Limitation of elevation rarely causes significant symptoms and is not additive after inferior oblique anterior transposition. And superior oblique tuck will correct somewhere between six and 10 degrees of excycler torsion. Thank you. We'll be having questions a little bit later. Thank you so much. That was a great talk and a very interesting case. Let me remind the audience to place their questions in the questions and answer box so we can make sure that your questions will be answered at the end of all talks. And now we'll have Dr. Sehan Oskan from Turkey, and she will talk on inactivation of the lateral rectus by periosteal fixation. Dear moderators, dear colleagues, it's my distinct pleasure to participate in the joint webinar organized by IPOSC and BNB POSA. And I'm going to talk about inactivation of lateral rectus muscle by periosteal fixation, and I have no potential conflict of interest to disclose. In periosteal fixation of lateral rectus muscle, the aim of surgery is to eliminate all of the attachments of lateral rectus muscle with the globe and totally inactivate the muscle. And this is a potentially reversible surgery, and the idea was originated by Alan Scott. So the major indications of this surgery are Duane syndrome and third nerve palsy. In Duane syndrome, paradoxical contraction is responsible for the up and down shoots and the globe retraction, and sometimes with limitation of adduction. So the aim is to eliminate all of the problems related to paradoxical contraction and then treat Duane syndrome as a six nerve palsy, which is a condition which is much more straightforward compared to Duane syndrome. However, loss of tonic contraction of lateral rectus muscle requires a transposition surgery to balance the medial rectus function. So here we see the surgical technique. We use 5-0 green etibone suture as a non-absorbable suture. We prefer green suture in order to be able to find the suture if any further surgery is required. So the situation is similar to a recession technique. And after cutting the muscle, we will palpate the orbital rim. And as you can see here, from posterior to anterior, we engage the needle. So this is an important trick because the needle is small. So, and when uh, engaging the needle from posterior to anterior, grasping the tissue is um, more uh, easy. And then afterwards, this is the uh, major tricky part. So I'm pulling this tissue. So it is totally inelastic and it is like the feeling is like pulling a stone. So this is a proof that we are in the periosteum. And then after suturation, the nose capsule is sutured to avoid reattachment of the lateral rectus muscle at the scleral area. So there are some modifications of this technique and some authors described a a situation of lateral rectus muscle to the posterior tenon instead of periosteum. And some others described the technique to reach the orbital periosteum via skin incision. 
And in the first years of this the description of this technique, we have reported a small group of uh, patients who, uh, in, uh, that the, our series included four cases with Duane syndrome, one ESO and three EXO cases. And periosteal fixation was combined with vessel sparing full tendon transposition. And uh, three cases underwent orbital MRI. So in our patient group, in the exoduane group, we have seen that augmented transpositions ended up with uh, exotropia and required further surgery. However, the other exo case that we have performed a non-augmented transposition ended up with a favorable result. So when we look at the results, we have seen that globe retraction decreased uh, to some extent but when we look at the up and down shoot, the up and down shoot de uh, decreased very significantly. So the major advantage of the surgery was that. So here you see the MRI of two of our cases. So yeah, the lateral rectus muscle can be followed uh, to insert to the orbital wall. So this is one of our cases with an isoduane with very disfiguring up and down shoots. Sometimes the cornea disappears. And this patient underwent periosteal fixation and vessel sparing transposition. And after surgery, up and down should disappear and the globe retraction persisted. And there's an ESO deviation. So six months later, he underwent another surgery for, with medial rectus recession. And this is his final post-op appearance, which was quite satisfactory. So this is the exoduine patient who had very disfiguring up and down shoot, and she underwent a non-augmented transposition in combination with lateral rectus periosteal fixation, and the outcome was quite favorable in this case. She did not require any further surgery. So this is an atypical Duane case, which is a rare form of Duane as left synergistic divergence. So this patient underwent two previous operations, and he still had this divergence problem. And here on this video, you can see the divergence movement on right case. And in those cases, the medial rectus function is sometimes there's no function, sometimes there's very limited function. So those cases do not require a transposition surgery. So this is his appearance post-op two years. You can see that the divergence disappeared and there's an angle kappa. So the patient was orthophoric in primary position. And this is the post-op uh, video. As you can see here, the divergence disappeared. There's uh, some uh, small abduction despite the uh, periosteal fixation in this patient. So this is the post-operative MRI. In this, in this case, there was a severe atrophy of medial rectus muscle and the lateral rectus muscle could be followed uh, to attach the orbital wall. And this is another case with left synergistic divergence with divergence on up case. So you can see that on up case, the divergence increases as well as globe retraction. So, and this can be uh, observed uh, better in the video, as you can see here. Now on up case, the uh, divergence increases and the, as well as the globe retraction in the left eye. So this patient underwent lateral rectus periosteal fixation in combination with a large medial rectus resection as large as nine millimeters. And at the end of surgery, we need to put a conjunctival graft from nasal to temporal side in order to close the conjunctiva. And both abduction and adduction was limited and there was no divergence. And this can be uh, observed better in the video. As you can see on right case, there is no divergence movement. And on up case, there is also no, no divergence, but there is some globe retraction and there is no abduction in this patient. So this outcome was quite satisfactory for this patient. So in isoduane, augmented transpositions uh, give more satisfactory result. In exoduane, non-augmented transpositions are more satisfactory. And in synergistic divergence, there seems to be no need for a transposition. And in a group from India, uh, from a group from India, it was reported that partial transposition, uh, uh, vertical rectus transposition. Uh, was giving better results compared to the exoduane group with, uh, where the doctors did not uh, perform any transposition surgery. And the field of binocular single vision was larger, larger in those who had uh, transposition surgery. 
So to conclude, does inactivation of lateral rectus muscle convert Duane syndrome into a 6 hour palsy? Well, actually, the answer is no. The response of surgery is still different than that of 6 hour palsy. And the possible problems with this type of surgery are over and under corrections, residual globe retraction, and potential risk of anterior segment ischemia, as for rectus surgery may be required in those cases. So the internal policy, the aim is complete lateral rectus inactivation, and the outcome is favorable in previous literature reports, and an adducting force is required in severe cases to overcome the orbital fibrosis problem. And recently, uh, a large series was reported from the Moorfields group, and in severe cases, combination with medial rectus periosteal fixation give more satisfactory result. And uh, this topic was discussed in, uh, discussed in the previous IPOSC webinar by Jill Adams. So this case has a left third nerve palsy and the right eye is blind. So this patient had uh, this huge abnormal head posture, which he suffered a lot for, for this problem. And this is his appearance before surgery, and he had an eyelid operation elsewhere, and so this, that's why he had this bizarre uh, eyelid uh, motility. And after periosteal fixation in combination with superorbic transposition, we have attraction sutures, and this was the maximal point that the left eye could be adducted passively. So we couldn't keep those sutures uh, as long as six weeks, then we need to, uh, the sutures were out after two weeks time, after removal of the sutures, the exodeviation increased a little bit, but the result was quite satisfactory for this patient. So the take home messages are in Duane syndrome, there's a limited effect in globe retraction. It's a very effective in severe and down shoots. However, for the uh, lateral rectus periosteal fixation, the best indication seems to be synergistic divergence. In third nerve policy, complete inactivation works better with addition of adductive force in severe cases. And to con uh, conclude overall, uh, it's a useful technique in very selected severe Duane syndrome cases and long-standing third nerve policy. So to conclude, we have had lots of joyful meetings uh, in Strabismus, and we are going to meet in Cancun, Mexico for the next ISA meeting, where we will have the opportunity to uh, be physically together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sehan, for that excellent talk, and I absolutely look forward to seeing you all in Cancun where we will hopefully meet again. And uh, now inviting, uh, last but not the least, Professor Ken Wright from USA to talk about minimally invasive strabismus surgery. Hello, I'm Ken Wright, and I'd like to share with you some new procedures I've developed over the past few years for small angle strabismus. They're minimally invasive strabismus surgery techniques. I'm director and founder of the Wright Foundation for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus based in Los Angeles, California. And I'm happy and proud to be adjunct professor, Queens University, Kingston, Canada. This patient in the chair was referred for double vision after LASIK surgery. I remember the LASIK surgeon called me and said, this shouldn't be a problem, it's just a small deviation. When I examined the patient, he had a right hyper of one to two prism doctors, a little bit more in down gaze, and he did have double vision. I was thinking, what can I do for this? So easy? No, it's not going to be easy. Standard surgery just won't work. And I thought of a dream I had about strabismus surgery. I do dream about strabismus surgery, interestingly enough. And it was just to cut the central tendon of a rectus muscle to weaken it a little bit. And my thought was, and this is a surgery I've developed, was to put in topical anesthesia, grasp the tendon insertion, take a blunt Westcott scissors, cut right through the conjunctiva and right through the central tendon to do a central tenotomy. And you'll hear a click if you actually get the tendon. And on the diagram on the left, you can see that in the uh, drawing. The right shows the result. The central tendon will fall back, weakening the rectus muscle just a little bit. And I remember I had a, uh, a fellow from Saudi Arabia, wonderful lady, and uh, she looked at me like I was out of my mind, telling the patient about a dream I had, and then I laid the patient back, and we're going to do the surgery, fully awake, just topical anesthesia. Let's see that video, my first central tenotomy, left inferior rectus tenotomy to weaken the left inferior rectus to correct a right hypertropia. 
see it's you got it. I, do you see things move? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. That was it. That's it. Huh. <laughs> no. Stop. Well, well, the patient and I both laughed after that because <laughs> I don't even think he felt it and it was so fast. So I sat him up and you know what? There really is a strabismus God because he was straight. Thank you, goodness, that it was it worked. And he had single vision, very happy. And then a year later, a year and a half later, he calls me. I have a little double vision. He had a residual hyper and I just cut that same inferior rectus right through the scar and he did great. I've looked at using the central tenotomy for other issues like esotropia or esophorias. It doesn't work for an eso deviation, not even a small phoria. It works for micro hypertropias, one to two prism diopters, maybe three. So the right central tenotomy is worth a try for micro hypertropias with diplopia. You get about one to, pr one to two prism diopters per rectus muscle central tenotomy, but you can do both eyes. So if you had a right hyper of let's say three to four, you could do the central tenotomy on the right superior rectus and the left inferior rectus. And that would maybe get three to four prism diopters because you get one to two for each tenotomy. It does not work for ESO deviations. When I was a fellow back in the early 1980s, I remember watching uh, Dr. Guyton, my mentor, and Dr. Parks, my, my other mentor, I did a fellowship with each, doing a resection procedure and removing part of the muscle and bringing the muscle forward, advancing the muscle, a typical resection. But my thought was, what if you left the muscle intact and you just did a plication and folded the muscle as we see in the diag diagram on the, on the left, Put your sutures posterior, pass your needles anterior through sclera, and then you create a fold. And this is a plication procedure. And on the right photograph, you can see a surgical photograph of the fold. And um, that fold, by the way, goes away post-op after about three weeks. My question was, does this preserve anterior circulation, anterior ciliary perfusion? And the photograph on your left is myself, 1982 doing fluorescein iris angiogram. And on the photograph on the right, that's the iris angiogram after a full inferior rectus plication. And you can see that the fluorescein pattern is still there, indicating that, yes, it is a vessel sparing procedure. So the right full plication, safe. You don't have to remove the muscle, so you're never going to have a lost muscle. There's no need for cautery. It works like a resection. It's a tightening procedure. You can use the same numbers for a resection. It's semi-reversible. If you cut the suture immediately, it will undo. It will reverse. If you cut after five days, it will it will become a little bit slack, reduce the effect a little bit. But if you cut after seven days, it just stays there. It really doesn't move much. It's vessel sparing. I do maximum up to six millimeters. And the reason for that is I don't like a big lump right there by the cornea, and I'm worried about possible delin. But other people do more, and if I need to do a large tightening procedure, I'll revert to the resection. But what about a medium deviation like six to eight prism diopters? Well, I thought, let's just placate the center of the muscle. In the drawing on the left, I've placed a suture through the center, three to four millimeters, tied a knot. And uh, that suture is placed five millimeters posterior to the insertion. Now I'm passing a scleral pass with a spatula needle in front of the insertion, and I fold the I fold the muscle forward. So I'm placating the center muscle, as you can see on the drawing on the right. I've changed my procedure a little bit because it was difficult to get posterior exposure without securing the eye with a traction suture. So I first place a traction suture. So I pass a 60 vicral S29 needle. I pass the needle right in front of the insertion through sclera, and the sclera is thick there, and so it's very safe, and there's no retina because you're in front of the aura serrata, you're over pars plana. You take the traction suture, in this case for an inferior rectus muscle, you take the eye up, exposing 
posterior muscle. Take a 0.5 forcep, go five millimeters posterior, grab the central three to four millimeters of the muscle, lift up and pass your needle from one of those uh, arms under your forcep and I double pass. I pass twice, which creates a cinch. And in this bottom photograph, you see a cinch posteriorly, five millimeters back. I've already passed my scleral suture and I pull it up. And on the lower right, you see the plicated central muscle. This is a fully awake patient and we're gonna give tetracaine drops over the inferior rectus muscle. The procedure is an inferior rectus central plication. The incision is made over the inferior rectus muscle in a semi-swan incision with blunt Westcott scissors. You can see the anterior ciliary vessels. We place a 6-0 vicral suture on a spatulated needle as a traction suture. That will pull the eye up to expose the inferior rectus muscle. It's a double arm suture and we're gonna place one needle five millimeters posterior to the insertion. And here's a needle being passed through the central aspect of the inferior rectus muscle. A knot is tied, muscle secured. Now the traction suture will be pulled up to advance the muscle to perform a central plication. You can see the muscle being pulled up. We're going to use a Conway retractor to show the central plication. This is then tied in place. In this case, a bow tie because I was going to do an adjustable check alignment, but this can be tied off at this point. Well, I found the central plication to be very, very useful, and it does give you six to eight prism adopters if you put your muscle uh, suture back five millimeters from the insertion. It's also very useful for divergence insufficiency esotropia, like this patient with an ESO of approximately 14 to 16 prism adopters at distance, four prism adopters at near, and I just ignored the right hyper one. And um, so I like in this situation of a deviation less than 20 prism adapters to do bilateral, lateral rectus, central plications. I compared my results with the older procedure, bilateral medial rectus recessions, to the newer procedure, lateral rectus, central plication. And, we, and the results were very similar, over 90%, no double vision in both groups, deviation less than five prism adapters, maybe slightly better in a lateral rectus, central plication. And again, this was for... Divergence insufficiency esotropia with less than 20 prism diopters deviation. Advantage of the right, advantages of the right central plication, it corrects six to eight prism diopters like clockwork. It's minimally invasive. It takes about 10 minutes of muscle. Topical or general anesthesia, you can do adjustable, which I really don't do anymore. I just do the fixed suture, tie it off. Preserves anterior ciliary perfusion. The ciliary vessels stay intact. Semi-reversible, you can cut it to reverse it, but you got to do that within five days. It's super safe. The needle pass is anterior to the insertion. There's no retina. You're, pars you're passing your suture over pars plana, and the sclera is thick. Never a lost muscle. So I put together a wrap. If you just need two, don't be blue. Follow me and do the central T for two prism diopter micro vertical. For six to eight prism diopters, don't hesitate. Central plicate. And that can be used for both horizontal or vertical strabismus. And let me show you my second hobby, second passion. And this is uh, a boat ride off the coast of Panama. I've been going down to Panama for surgical missions for over 20 years. Have You look great, Ken, on your on your surfing uh, board. <laughs> okay, those were great talks, Sarap. Don't you, don't you think so?
Absolutely. Really wonderful to hear from our panelists with such a wealth of knowledge. So if I could just invite you all um, to turn on your video and Andrew and I would like to put some questions to you, that's okay, for the next few minutes uh, from, the, from the, our audience and from ourselves. We had Andrew. great questions, and most of them were already answered on the on the chat box. But we will we have still some time to elaborate more on those questions. So let's start with Bob uh, talks on foreign incision for strabismus surgery. Uh, somebody asked about the use of microscope uh, for doing these type of surgeries. Bob, can you or I will ask all the panelists? Please turn your cameras on. Uh, Let's start with Bob. Do you sometimes use the microscope for strabismus surgery or in which, which cases? Uh, thank you. No, um, I, I tried using the microscope, but I found it too scary. Um, and I also lost the maneuverability of, of um, being able to look around corners a little bit. So although it's true those videos were taken down the microscope camera, uh, I would have not been using the microscope. I have my loops on and um, would have just worked around the camera or worked around the microscope and normally that wouldn't be there at all. What about you, Vincent? No, only my eyes. Okay, Sorab? So I always use the microscope. I think because I do a lot of cataract surgery and maybe that has to change my perspective and just mm -hmm. useful. And I just think you've got such an amazing magnifying device in the theater. Why will it away and try and use a loop? But that's just my... Good. And you, Tony? Um, I usually use loops because I like the sort of dynamic aspect of being able to move my head around. It's easier for the assistant not to get um, having to look down the microscope. But having said that, um, having just had a fellow from Sorab who tells me I should be using the microscope, <laughs> I have been using it a little bit to try it. But I naturally go back to my loops when things, you know, when when things are tough. Say hi. Uh, my choice is the same with Saurabh. So I prefer to be on the operating microscope. And Ken? Yeah, I don't use the, I've tried it. I don't use it because depth of focus is very narrow and your visual field is narrow. So you can't see where the hands are. So especially if you're training residents, it, I find it uh, restrictive, but I've used it, you know, whatever you get used to, I think that's important. Now you just use a plus 250 ad. I have to admit, I have started using it more frequently since I became presbyopic, but I use it regularly for all my reoperations and special procedures like fun procedures. Uh, Bob, one more question for you. Uh, do you think if you add the millimeters of conjunctiva you cut in the two incisions of a minimally invasive approach, uh, don't you find that you end up opening the same amount of conjunctiva with a fornix approach or even more than a fornix approach? Uh, it's an interesting question, and um, I've never really kind of thought about it that like that. Uh, I think the importance of the fornix incision, uh, as it uh, was pointed out by Ken Wright, was initially described by Marshall Parks, is its location. So it, it tends to fall in the fold of the conjunctiva and heal very nicely. Um, uh, I suspect uh, the minimally invasive, it depends how big those incisions are, um, would be similar, but um, it's just a different procedure. I, yeah, I don't quite understand the question. And do, do, do you find the inflammation you see after the procedure is similar with both approaches? Or do you find one approach gives you less inflammation than the other one? I would say you get less inflammation with the fornix based incision. Uh, sorry, the okay. fornix incision. Okay. Vincent, it's very clear to us after you, after you talk that in fourth nerve paresis, you always prefer to operate on oblique muscles than on rectus muscle surgeries. Nice, nice that you got the, the keywords. <laughs> okay, so can you please explain in more detail which is the combined oblique surgery you perform and in which, uh, which are the clinical characteristics of the patients where you indicate this procedure? The problem is that some acquired cases 
I have a long-term compensa compensation. So you cannot separate uh, excyclo with anatomical predisposition and uh, force nerve palsy. So I definitely want to, to nominate that as excyclo deviation. So I'm looking for excyclo deviation and my result is also focus of excyclo deviation. So when I, I consider to have good result is when I have no more excyclo deviation uh, subjectively and, and objectively. And the, the, the mean I, I use to measure uh, subjectively is very, very accurate, much more than Maddox. So my result, uh, my good result, I very, very uh, strongly considered. So um, sometimes we have normal cover test. And when I, at that point that some, some people have cyclodiplopia because they have no hyperdeviation to compensate. So in that type, it, it's this patient, I operate inferior optic uh, recession, and sometimes I have to operate at a second time with superior oblique res, uh, uh, reinforcement. So I'm focused on the excyclodeviation, whatever the etiology. So uh, sometimes I, I, I so ma many patients, I operate on tall topical anesthesia as, as can do. Uh, and sometimes surprisingly, um, I, I um, prepare for inferior oblique recession and I have to uh, have to uh, perform Arada Ito procedure too, because it was not only, it was insufficient. So uh, the main point is, Overcorrection is so rare, so rare, exactly as compared with exophoria. Thank you, Vincent. So, Rav, there were many questions on the chat box regarding um, the anti elevation symptom uh, 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 syndrome after anterioration of the inferior oblique. Uh, that's why you said that in your preference was to let the posterior fibers to hang loose after uh, and only suturing the anterior fibers of the inferior oblique. My question is because I that was also my procedure of choice many years ago, but I stopped doing that because I I had to reoperate some of these patients because of uh, reappearance of the inferior oblique overaction, and when I did so, I found that those posterior fibers that I let losing uh, hanging uh, back, they will crawl back to the inferior oblique original insertion and reinsert there. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Uh, thanks, Andrea. So just to clarify for a few more uh, questions on the on the chat. So I don't, I do try and have a single point of fixation after the inferoblique anterization. I think spreading it out is a problem because spread out the tendon, you will lead to an anti-elevation syndrome. So in our study, we didn't find a late um, undercorrection. And I think the reason for that is, uh, and this was taught to me by one of Tony's fellows, and this is why it's so important to get fellows from good mentors who teach you new techniques, is to divide the, te divide the tendon right at the in the tendinous portion, not in the muscular portion. So when you do that and you know you're doing the right thing, you don't get any bleeding, then you don't get this late undercorrection, I find. So I, I tend, try and tend to fix it at a single point, but I haven't, we haven't seen in our study any late undercorrection. Okay, let me ask the panel again. Uh, let's start with uh, Bob. Do you, uh, do you take the anterior and posterior fibers and, and just uh, insert them together or you, you do another thing? Yeah, I bunch them up. Um, so I, I put the two, I, I put the, 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 the anterior and posterior fibers together about one millimeter apart and bunch them, muscle up. Okay, Vincent, you do Me you too. bunch? Me too. Say hun. Uh, well, actually, my preference is totally dependent on the case. I must say that my routine uh, inferobic weakening procedure is this insertion, and I'm very happy with the results. But for the anterior position surgery, uh, I uh, mainly do it for some restrictive problems, things that I need to, when I need some anti-elevation, and mainly for the ones for DVD. And in asymmetric DVD cases, uh, we prefer uh, to suture only the anterior fibers as was described by Saura and leave the posterior fibers free in the eye with the less DVD 
And in the more uh, in the eye with a more prominent DVD, then we do the uh, suture the both fibers, but not as, as in a spreaded fashion in a bunched up fashion. And we obtained um, quite um, symmetrical results with this. So I think the effect is not the same. And the choice of adding the sutures is uh, has a significantly different uh, clinical appearance. And uh, so it, it is dependent on the patient. Tori? Uh, yeah, well, I cut the uh, tendon off right at the sclera underneath the lateral rectus. I put a continuous suture into the tendon, and then I um, attach them at a single point just at the lateral border of the inferior rectus. So you and bunch we, them? Well, I bunch them, I bunch them up, and I, I think that's a really important part, part of the procedure. And we re recorded, uh, we um, published 100 consecutive cases, and we didn't get any anti-elevation syndrome. So I, it, it seems to work for me. And Ken? Yes. Um, I think number one, you want to make sure that you pass your sutures close to sclera, because if you resect the inferior oblique and then anterize it even a little, you're going to get anti elevation. So you don't want to resect the inferior oblique. And it's hard to pass close to sclera because you're way posterior. So I like to use the right grooved hook under the muscle so I can suture over the grooved hook. And then when I replace it, I don't anteriorize anymore because you get lid fissure narrowing and you can get anti-elevation and you can get unmasking of a bilateral. So I almost never bring the, the inferior oblique close to the inferior rectus. I always leave it at least three millimeters posterior. And if I have a small residual inferior oblique overaction, who cares? You know, I used to try to get rid of all the inferior oblique overaction. You don't need to. Now, okay. that's, that's totally different from a DVD. But we almost don't see DVD anymore because we're operating early for estotropia. If I can add something, I have many patients with a resection of inferior oblique of five millimeters with anterior transposition of plus one or plus two and no anti-elevation because it depends on the elasticity of the inferior oblique. So, Rav, do you have any, any further questions for the other speakers? So um, I have a few questions for Professor Wright, if that's okay. So you know, thank you for your very interesting talk on these innovative techniques. So just asking about the central tenotomy, do you ever worry about cutting the one of the muscular vessels because it's just sort of underneath uh, uh, the, the central bit where you make the incision? How do you avoid that? I always worry about it. <laughs> and um, you really, it's a blind procedure. The interciliaries are lateral and I'm doing my tenotomy central. So I would, you usually I don't get the bleeding. You saw my video, that was the first time I did it. it but I do get uh, anterior ciliary bleeding and I just take a cotton tip with phenylephrine two and a half percent and I just put pressure for two minutes. And the problem is you're gonna go one minute and get bored and take it off. So I watch the clock for two minutes and you gotta put the pressure for two minutes. Thank you. And just looking at the effect of central tenotomy, do you think the effect is long lasting or do you think, you know, the tendon heals up and you get a weakening of the effect? And if so, when does it happen? Well, how long does it take for a muscle to heal? It's about five days. You can't move it after five days. Yeah. Now, does it have a hundred percent strength? No. If you look at hand surgeons, they use non-absorbable because it takes probably six months to really get full strength, but it won't move after five days. I've cut uh, applications and the darn thing doesn't move. It just laughs at you. You're trying to undo it. So um, no, it sticks back, but you know, a lot of these small verticals are phorias and they can recur. So, but no, it, it lasts. It absolutely lasts. Sure. And just my last question to you, I think in a similar way, with your applications, do you use the same dose response table that you do say for your resection or do you think it's as effective or less effective or more effective than a resection? Yeah, one of my fellows from Korea actually looked at that resection versus application, it's the same. I used to think you needed to do more with application, but I was wrong and he showed me that. You, I use the same numbers. Now I don't do more than five to six millimeters because I think the lump gets too big. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 
Can I just say, Han, can I just ask you a question about your technique? I thought that was really innovative, the uh, periosteal fixation of the lateral rectus. How easy is it for a beginner to start doing this? Would you start doing with an orbital surgeon? Or would it be better to maybe learn to do a pulley fixation? Is that, is that simpler to do? Uh, uh, Saurabh, I think, um, uh, well, the pulley fixation is, uh, as you know, it's um, it's a surgery instead of a pardon procedure, so it is uh, uh, it's not a, a, a surgery to replace periosteal fixation. But it was, as I was mentioned, um, uh, a group uh, reported that um, fixating the lateral rectus muscle to the uh, to the posterior tenon may may give similar results. But I don't have experience with that, so. Regarding the first part of your question, uh, I don't have any uh, orbital specialists with me. And the technique that I have do, done is was exactly as I demonstrated during my presentation. I just fill the orbital rim. I don't make any, um, any cuts. I just fill the orbital area and then engage the needle deeply. So this is the most challenging part because it is really, uh, our needle is small to engage this tissue, but uh, what afterwards, uh, what I need to do is when I pull it, it is just like pulling a, you know, very hard. This is like pulling a bone or uh, it's not, if there's any elasticity, that means that you are in the tenons. But for a, a beginner, I may say that if you feel yourself unsafe, and if you, when you pass the suture, because there is always a threat that you have the feeling whether you're going to lose the needle or not. So it, it is really hard at this area. So this is why I recommend to, go to engage the needle from posterior to anterior part. So in that case, if a, 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 a surgeon who is beginning this type of surgery, if you, you pass the suture and you feel yourself unsafe, to make a repeat uh, engagement. When you pull it, if it is a little bit uh, elastic, the, uh, although I don't have experience with that, the literature report, even it is only with three cases, uh, mentions that it is effective. But uh, personally, I prefer uh, the muscle to remain in a uh, stable area instead of an elastic tissue because otherwise it may be mobile and um, a mobile tissue may have more um, a tendency to attach to the areas that you don't want to the muscle to go I, actually the attachment through the globe despite you, we close the tenons capsule and so on may be higher this is just a suggestion i don't have any comparison with this and actually, um, and there is no comparative study on that. Thank you, Sehan. Um, so Tony, a, a quick question for you. Um, you know, you said the superior oblique turkey is a self titrating procedure. Do you do it in the same way, uh, whether it's a congenital or acquired, or you know, how much do you tuck? Do you do the same for everyone, or do you change it depending on how big the deviation is or how much the torsion is? Oh, uh, that's a good question, sorry. So it, for acquired, Acquired deviations when the um, tendon and the muscle are relatively normal in every other respect, like they're not very stretchy or anything. I tend to do a 10 millimeter tuck. I then do a full suction test. So I gauge it all on the full suction test at the time of surgery. And I it's all by feel, which is difficult to teach feel, but um, I just feel whether I feel it's, it needs to be tight enough to work and it needs to be not too tight. So I, I do it on the full suction test, but on, on those that we reported, which was almost 60 cases, um, we did pretty much all of them had a 10 millimeter tuck. They're all, uh, uh, you know, the acquired cases and uh, the bigger the deviation, the bigger the effect of, of the tuck. Great, thank you. I'm very aware of the time and I know we just have a couple of minutes. So Andrew, do you have any last questions for our panelists before I hand over to Jason? 
to introduce if, the next. If I can add a comment regarding lateral fixation, um, I have been done uh, been doing this, which is easier for me, a regular strabismologist, with a right needle, which is not invented by Ken Wright, by the way. It's a baby right needle uh, used for frontalis suspension. And I pass the sutures through the needle, and then I go and cut uh, the, the skin on the side of the canthus, and I take the needle out, uh, passing through the periosteum. And th that way, I find it's much easier for me. Uh, may I make a comment, just a small comment? Well, uh, these uh, techniques, maybe I'm not an orbital surgeon, and I, I don't do eyelid surgery. But these skin incisions and so on, this, uh, these techniques look more uh, invasive to me. And on the other hand, uh, I must mention again that the suture that we prepare uh, should better be um, a dyed suture. And that's why we use green etibon suture in order to be able to find uh, the suture area in case of any necessity to yeah. go back again. Actually, the skin incision is a stab incision in one of the little wrinkles you have there. I don't even suture it and, and you don't see the scar at all. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you to the audience. Thank you for staying with us. I'm gonna hand over now to Jason uh, to introduce the next webinar for us. Jason. Thank you, uh, Sarab. And, uh, Thank you so much for joining the webinar on behalf of the IPOS Education Committee. I would like to thank our moderator and all our staff speakers and Biposa for organizing this wonderful webinar. We have all learned a lot. And so I would have the pleasure to announce our next webinar, which is this time with our Japanese colleagues, the JASA, uh, the Japanese Association for Strabismus and, uh, and, and Biopia. This time will be on the topic of esotropia. And it will be on August 21st, a Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, EDT time. So uh, we will have uh, Miho Sato and myself as the moderator. We will have uh, John Peter Sontier from Denmark, uh, Sachiko Nashina from Japan, uh, Chen Zhao from China, uh, Daniela Tsioplan from Romania, uh, Shura, uh, uh, Tar uh, uh, Yokohama from Japan, and Tokoshi and Go, uh, Gosaki from Japan uh, to share with us a various topic on the isotropia. So please, please mark your Canada and join us for this wonderful webinar next time. Thank you to you all. Thank you. <laughs>